challenging last couple of weeks for me. But you know what? God's good. He's here. He loves us. Uh, you know, to me, it's like, even though I, if I would have stayed home and studied all day, I'd stand before you and feel like I'm not ready. <laughs> it wouldn't really matter with me. But, you know, I started thinking, I thought, you know, just to go and to hang out with those of like precious faith. Behold how beautiful and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the oil upon the head, on the head of Aaron even running down on his beard and onto the edges of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon that descends upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. You know, and that psalm is just so powerful. I just love that. God loves it when we, as his kids, are dwelling together in unity. And that thought that it is there that he commanded the blessing, life forevermore. It's Jesus and his disciples, his brothers, brethren, dwelling together in unity. And Jesus commanded the blessing, life forevermore. That's when it was really first promised to his disciples. And really that psalm finds its fulfillment like all the word finds its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. All right, so um, I really feel sorry for Jack and Tim because, (laughs) oh, thanks. Uh, I'm going to teach what they had to listen to last night. (laughs) So Pastor Dave, he, he used to do that too. He would teach, but Pastor Dave, you know, he's like two, three, four, five levels way above me. But he would teach, when he went to the prison, he would teach what he taught on Sunday. You know, so since I really, I've been going through Hebrews, but I don't have the next Hebrews study ready. So I just thought, well, poor Jack, poor Tim. (laughs) Mark chapter 6. We're in the Gospel of Mark chapter number 6. We're going to look at the end of the chapter and then get into chapter 7. So um, we won't be too long. I won't keep you till 830, I promise. Maybe till 8 o'clock or 8.15, but after that you can get the hook and and pull me out. In in Mark chapter 6, now as I said, we've been teaching through the gospel of Mark in the prison. And I always say to the ladies, and I say here when I get to teach or wherever I get to teach, there's nobody like Jesus. Just nobody like him. I mean, he had more compassion, more power, more wisdom than anybody And he was always available to anybody and everybody that needed him. And as you study, if you, and you should study what other people believe, the cults and that, you should study what they believe and know why they believe what they believe. And of course, we know what we believe and why we believe what we believe. And when you do that, you see whether it's Confucius or Muhammad or Buddha or you just fill in the blank, there's nobody like Jesus. There's nobody like him. I can't wait to be with the Lord. I can't wait till he comes back and he sets up his kingdom. It's going to be so glorious. And in the gospel of Mark, when Dave taught through it, he called it the gospel uh, for ADD. You know, remember that? (laughs) And if you guys really want to hear what this is all about, go back on Vimeo or YouTube or whatever and listen to Pastor Dave teach through it because it's just so good. But it's because everything is short and to the point, and he leaves a lot of stuff out. And so I'm, since I get to teach and I get to pick where I wanted to start, I thought I'd like to start with Jesus walking on the Sea of Galilee, because that's just such a cool story. So we're going to go right on through the end of the chapter and into chapter number 7, where the Pharisees and the scribes, they come from Jerusalem to find fault with Jesus. And like I said, we will stop somewhere around 8 o'clock or 8.15, no later. Take a look at verse number 45. Jesus walks on the sea. Immediately he made his disciples get into a boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida uh, while he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. Now, here again, here's such a great picture of Christ. He's ministered all day, He's ministered to the people. If you go back and you look through all of his life up to this time, he's just busy, 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 busy. And when he is exhausted, what's he do? He goes to pray. So he sends his disciples away on the boat. He had just fed the 5,000. 
he sends the disciples away onto the Sea of Galilee in the boat, and he goes up to the mountain to pray. And that's where Jesus found his strength, was in prayer. He loved to commune with his Father, and we should too. And so he sends the multitudes away. It says, now when evening had come, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. And then he saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. So this is kind of a cool insight we get. Jesus is up on the mountain, Sea of Galilee, he can see down. He sees them straining, rowing, trying to get to the other side. They're having a hard time doing what God told them to do, what Jesus told them to do. Sometimes that's us, right? We have a difficult time sometimes in the things that God has called us to do. He sends us to do something, and the end result really isn't dependent upon our efforts or anything. We're just supposed to be about what God told us to do. He said, go to the other side. And they went out in their rowing, and the wind was contrary to them, obviously. So they're rowing and rowing and struggling at the oars, and Jesus sees them. It says, then when he saw them rowing, uh, for the wind was contrary to them. Now about the fourth watch of the night, so that would be like at three in the morning, from three to six is the fourth watch of the night. So Jesus, not only praying, he's praying late <laughs> or early into the morning. <laughs> he's had a long day and he's spending a lot of time in prayer. And so in the fourth watch of the night, three o'clock in the morning or thereabout, he sees them in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, and they're struggling at the oars as the wind is contrary to them. And it says, now about the fourth watch, he came, and he would have passed them by. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost, and they cried out, for they all saw, they all saw him and were troubled, but immediately he talked with them and said to them, be of good cheer it is I do not be afraid so I really like this story because there's stuff that's mentioned in there that just to me just kind of seems weird Jesus tells them <laughs> to go to the other side and they can't get there the wind is blowing and they're struggling and so he walks on the sea and they see him and they think in their heads it's a spirit or it's a ghost and so they're kind of panicking and I kind of like the idea, you know, they're probably like, dude, look, start rowing, you know, and they're, let's get out of here. What's happening? And so Jesus comes walking to them on the water, and it says he would have passed them by. So Jesus told them to go across. Jesus saw their struggle. Jesus came to them, but he would have passed them by. What, what is that all about? I really don't know, but I think Jesus just simply wanted them to cry out to him. He just wanted them to call out, or he would have just went right on by. Maybe. Maybe that's what it was. They were in the center of his will. They were doing what they were told to do. He goes to them, but they didn't, if they wouldn't have cried out, he probably would have went right on by. But they cried out to him. And really for us too, you know, we can be in the center of God's will. We can be doing all the things he's called us to do, we can be struggling in the ministry that we're in. We need to cry out to him because he sees, he knows, he comes to us. And nevertheless, we have a responsibility to cry out to him. And so they do. They cry out to the Lord. And he says, be of good cheer. It is I do not be afraid. And we know in this account, because there's only one time in the gospel that he walked on the water. In this account, it doesn't give us the fact that Peter got out of the boat. You remember that? So that's why a lot of people think that Peter actually was the author. John Mark, being his nephew, I believe, he recounted the uh, gospel to John Mark and he wrote it. But it's really Peter's account, or so many people think. Now, whether it is or not, we're not 100% sure. We'll know when we get to ask Peter, right? <laughs> I can, you know, I say it a lot. I can't wait to get to heaven and I want to see Jesus, I want to hang out with Jesus, I want to hang out with all of the Old Testament saints, the New Testament saints. I've got so many questions, I'm like a little two, three-year-old kid. It's just got a whole bunch of questions, you know. And I don't like to live in the world of speculation. We all do it, I do it. But it's, it's so easy to speculate about so many things. Let's just stick to the Word, 
and not worry about all the fine details. So the, the account that gives us where Peter got out, I, I really love that. Because Peter sees Jesus, Jesus says, it's I, don't be afraid. And he says, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you. <laughs> I love that. Don't you love that? And Jesus says, come, come on, bro. And he gets out and he starts to walk. And we know the story, you know, he's all excited in the moment. But then he gets his eyes off the Lord and he sees the wind and the waves and he starts to panic and he starts to sink. Oh, Lord, save me. And Jesus grabs him. And we know that the boat miraculously is on the other side. Now, as his disciples, you've got to be amazed at the things that you've seen him do. And this is probably the first two years of his three and a half year ministry or whatever. And they have seen him raise the dead. They have seen him heal lepers. They have seen him calm the Sea of Galilee. Remember that one? Where they're out on the sea and Jesus is tired and he's asleep in the, in the stern of the boat and the wind and the waves are crashing over the boat and he's getting soaked, but he's exhausted. He's not waking up. And they're like, Lord, don't you care that we're perishing? And he gets up and he says, oh, ye of little faith. Where's your faith? And what's he do? Remember, he just rebukes the wind and the sea. He says, peace, be still. And it's like, whoa, dude, just glass. And his apostles, his disciples, what do they do? They're like, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? They knew. They knew that Jesus was much more than a man, much more than a carpenter, much more than a prophet. They knew that they were standing in the midst of God Almighty, even though they might have been afraid to say so. Peter wasn't later, but they knew Jesus wasn't an ordinary man. And so such a wonderful account, such a cool account of Jesus walking on the water when he went up to them in the boat. It says there in 51, and then the wind ceased and they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled. I would say so. <laughs> you see somebody walking on the water come up to you, it's the Lord. Yeah, you, that, that's probably the understatement of the century right there. They were greatly amazed and marveled. Uh, for they had not understood about the loaves and because their hearts were hardened. And so it makes a reference back to the 5,000 that were fed with the five loaves and the two fish and how easily it is to forget what God has just done. And the Bible says that their heart, hearts were hardened and they didn't really get it. In verse number 53, it says, And when they had crossed over and came to the land of Gennesaret and anchored there, and when they came out of the boat immediately, the people recognized him. They ran through the whole surrounding region and began to carry about on beds those who were sick to where uh, they heard he was. And wherever he entered into villages, cities, or the country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might just touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched him were made well. So just such an, a powerful uh, story about Jesus and everywhere he goes the people are just flocking to him it would be the same today if Jesus was walking here today everybody would be flocking to him and they're all concerned about their loved ones they're all wanting to carry anybody sick anybody that needs the master's touch they all want to get them to Jesus and how encouraging that should be for you and I you know, we, maybe some of us don't feel like we got the gift of evangelism. Maybe you've never led anybody to Christ. Well, you know, you should learn how to do that. But nevertheless, one of the greatest things I think we all have, and that's prayer. I don't believe there's one person that's come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior aside from prayer. I know people that have godless parents and grandparents, and you just look at their lives and go, how in the world did they ever come to know who the Lord really is. But when you look back, oftentimes you will see that there was somebody there, instrumental Christian, undoubtedly praying for them. Or it could be just, you know, they cut somebody off on the freeway <laughs> and the guy they cut off prayed for them. <laughs> How simple is that? You know, we get cut off on the freeway, that's an open door to pray for that person. All kinds of stuff like that. And those are some of the things I can't wait to hear in heaven. Hey, bro, you cut me off on the freeway and... 
Yeah, I remember you. Oh, yeah, well, um, you prayed for me, and God, in his mercy, he answered your prayer, and I got in, you know, by God's grace. You know, there's going to be a lot of, I think there'll be a lot of cool stuff like that. All right, so as we come now to chapter 7, chapter 7 is where I taught in the prison last night, uh, and we just went through the first 23 verses. Uh, Whether or not we get through it or not, I don't know, but we'll try. In verse number 1 of chapter 7, it says, Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. And now um, when they saw some of his disciples eat with eat bread with defiled, that is, unwashed hands, they found fault. So as this chapter starts, there's really nothing wrong with washing your hands before you eat, right? <laughs> but there's a whole lot more behind this story because these guys are finding fault with people that are not doing anything wrong, and we see what it is as we start to go through it. The interesting thing, one of the interesting things to me is that they came from Jerusalem to find fault with Jesus. And that's got to be one of the stupidest things I think a man can do, to find fault with the Lord. They've got preconceived ideas about who Jesus is, what he should be doing, and what he shouldn't be doing. So they come from Jerusalem, scribes and Pharisees. You remember the Pharisees are the very um, orthodox side of the two religious camps, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Sadducees were very materialistic, didn't believe in the afterlife, just believed in the here and now. And if you believe in just the here and now, you might as well eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow you die. And so it's kind of weird, but that was the way the sad, or the, yeah, the Sadducees were. But the Pharisees, they believed in the afterlife. They believed in God, the angels, and all of that. And they decided they would come to try to find fault with Jesus. Like I said, bad idea because you're not going to find fault with somebody who is faultless. So they come with these preconceived ideas and they want to judge him according to the traditions. As we read on, it says, For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they have washed their hands in a special way. And there's the key. It was in a special way. It wasn't cleanliness so your hands aren't dirty before you eat. They had a tradition. They had a special way that everybody was supposed to wash their hands before they would eat bread together. So unless they washed in this special way, uh, which was holding the tradition of the elders, and when they came from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things uh, which they have received and hold, like the washings of cups and pitchers and copper vessels and couches. So uh, they had some traditions, and I wrote down, I actually wrote down a couple of quotes from a couple of rabbis um, who actually exalt the Mishnah, which is an, uh, uh, the Mishnah is a oral interpretation of the written law. And so, you know, it's kind of like if God said in his word, you know, don't do any servile work on the Sabbath, they would say, well, what is, serv- what is servile work? What does that mean? So they would try to figure out the best way to interpret that And it was written in the Talmud, and the Mishnah was part of that. And so they would write these traditions and these laws, but it got to the point where they elevated the tradition above the Word of God itself. So uh, in Judaism, they honored the written law, but there was also this oral law that I'm speaking of. It was man's tradition, his interpretation on top of the written law. There was a rabbi, uh, his name is Eliezer, And I'm just writing a quote from something I read from another pastor. Um, And he quotes this guy, and he says, this Rabbi Eliezer, he says, He who expounds the scriptures in opposition to the tradition has no share in the world to come. So in other words, somebody's teaching the word of God, but they're doing it in opposition to the oral interpretation of the word of God. Then he has no share in the world to come. That's kind of like what I'm doing right now. That's what I told the girls last night. I guess I didn't have no share as far as these guys are concerned because they're exalting their word above God's word. I think God, when he wrote his word, he made it like you hear Pastor Dave say a lot. He puts the cookies on the bottom shelf so the kids can get it. Everybody can get to it. 
And so when God says it, he means it, he means what he says. There was also a writing in the Mishnah uh, that says, it is, greater, it is a greater offense to teach anything contrary to the voice of the rabbis than to contradict scripture itself. It's a greater offense to teach anything contrary to the rabbis than to uh, contradict scripture itself. So here, here's the picture. They're exalting man's word above God's word. And a lot of the Jewish people, you know, they, they listen to what their rabbis say. And their rabbis will say, well, Jesus is not the Savior. He's not the Messiah. Don't have anything to do with it. And they just say, okay. And they just kind of check their brains at the door, I guess, instead of reading the word. They listen to what their rabbis teach and not so much what the word of God is teaching. And the rabbis do. They exalt the, word of, they exalt the oral tradition above the written word of God. Now, you know, like I, I made mention of the servo work, no servo work on the Sabbath. Today, it's like, okay, you can't wear high heels, girls. I told this to the ladies at the prison. You can't wear high heels. You can't wear false eyelashes. I don't think you can wear fake fingernails. And on and on and on the list goes because you're bearing a burden on the Sabbath. That's servo work. They have a certain amount of a distance that you can walk. There's certain things you can do and you can't do any more. And so they begin to exalt man's word above God's word. And like it says here, they also had this ritual with the washings of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and couches. And in verse number five, it says, Then the Pharisees and the scribes, they asked him, they asked Jesus, Why do your disciples walk according to the tradition? Uh, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but they eat bread with unwashed hands. So it would appear that this is just the first question of the confrontation when they come to find fault with Jesus and they see his disciples eating and not going through this prescribed washing. And so they say to Jesus, hey, why do your disciples wash or uh, eat bread without going through this tradition? And Jesus answered, and I love his answer to them, he says, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites as it is written? <laughs> now, when you start a conversation like that with somebody, you call them a hypocrite, you know it's going to be kind of uptight conversation, right? <laughs> you hypocrites. Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites as it is written? This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments or the precepts of men. So Jesus just calls them right out. First, he says, you guys are hypocrites. Now, hypocrites, you've heard it from Dave. I'm sure you've heard it a lot. A hypocrite isn't somebody who says one thing and does something different. That's the result of being a hypocrite. A hypocrite is just somebody pretending to be something they're not. The idea of wearing a mask. Prepent, uh, pretending to be something or someone you're not. And that's what they were doing. And Jesus, many times, he called them out. You guys love the long robes. You love the greetings in the marketplaces. You stand and you make long prayers that everybody can see how holy and how righteous you are, basically, was what he was saying. But he said, you guys are hypocrites. You're like uh, whitewashed tombs. You know, the tombs are painted outside and they're nice and pretty outside. But what's inside the tomb? dead men's bones you're full of corruption and perversion adultery fornication all of that you guys look really good on the outside but inside you're just like a a sepulcher full of um, death and decay now the problem that was obviously very prevalent at that time among the religious leaders is that the people were honoring god with their mouth and not with their heart. And you know that? That can easily happen to us as a Christian. I have a pastor friend who wrote down, um, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven things that could actually be said of us as Christians. Something similar could be said of us. And this is something that Jack wanted to hear, so I'm going to say it again, Jack. <laughs> okay, number one, they attend church, but their heart is far from me. 
They read their Bible, but their heart is far from me. They pray eloquent, eloquently, but their heart is far from me. They contribute money, but their heart is far from me. They do ministry, but their heart is far from me. They love to sing, but their heart is far from me. They talk to others about Jesus, but their heart is far from me. I really think that as a Christian, you know, we need to, as the Bible says, we need to examine ourselves to make sure that we're of the faith, that we're in the faith. It's easy as you, and I know because I've been walking with the Lord for 38 years, and as you progress in your walk, it's just easy to kind of slow down and not make the progress maybe that you should be making. And like Pastor Dave says, we shouldn't be, you know, slowing down. We should be getting closer and closer and closer to God. It shouldn't be that we see somebody that's just saved and they're all fired up and they're on fire for the Lord. And the guy that's been a Christian for 30 years, you can't even tell he's a Christian. You know? And that's actually something that's very valid, something that can happen very easily to us. And really, I think the big key and something I love to teach all the time, the key to having a strong, vibrant Christian life is to stay in the word, stay in prayer, stay in fellowship. Go to church. You might not want to go to church. Go to church. Don't go to live stream. Go to church. <laughs> you know, stay in church. Stay in prayer. Stay in the word, and you're going to be strong. Like the early church, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in the breaking of bread and fellowship, and in prayer. So those three things right there are so critical. Or we can just kind of find ourselves on what would be an illusionary plateau that doesn't exist now pastor dave says it this way and this is for you dave if you're watching <laughs> christianity is like a grease pole <laughs> you're either climbing up or slipping down and me and tim we have a, a a big laugh with this one because we're both like dude i can't climb a grease pole <laughs> and then dave remember tim when he comes back and goes i did it <laughs> okay i lose this one dave i give up we need to take heed to ourselves. We need to discipline ourselves. You know, that's what the Apostle Paul said. He said, you know, I run this race in such a way to win. You know, everybody, you know, that competes in, in uh, sports is, is temperate. You know, they, they discipline their body. They get their body in shape. You know, you don't go run a 20-mile marathon the day before you eat a dozen donuts. You know what I mean? You, you're just not going to win. So you're, you're very temperate. But Paul the Apostle said, you know, I buffet my body and I make it my slave, lest after I preach to other people, I become a castaway or I become disqualified or I become a vessel that God says, I used to use that vessel all the time and now I'm done with it. I get put on the shelf. We often talk and I've heard it said, it's like a cup. You put a cup of your favorite coffee, coffee cup or tea cup is out on the back wall and it's sitting on the back wall or on the back table outside. And you just happen to look out through the window and you see the cat peeing in it. You're probably done with that cup. I don't think you're using it anymore. You know what I mean? And this is the idea that we're vessels to be used by the master. But if we become polluted and defiled, it's easy, it's easy for him to put us up on the shelf and just use another vessel. And that's what Paul was saying. I buffet my body. I make it my slave lest after I preach to other people, I become a castaway. I become disqualified. That's the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul, to me, is the greatest Christian that ever lived save Jesus Christ. Nobody went through more than he did. Nobody was used by God like him. And if that guy realized that, you know what? I got to discipline my body. I got to make my flesh my slave. You don't want to go to church? Go to church. You don't want to pray? Start praying. You don't want to read the word? You got to get into the word. So we too need to discipline our bodies that we could be right in the center of God's will and not find ourselves honoring God with our lips, but our hearts being far from him. Jesus goes on and says in verse number eight, for laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of man. And there's a little hyphen there, a little pause in time. He stopped. He let him think about it. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men. And there's a pause. You need to think about that, guys. You're laying aside the word of God and you're holding men's opinions and his traditions. He calls, them, he calls it the way it is. 
And then he goes on and says, the washing of pitchers and cups and many other such things you do. And he said to them, all too well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother and he who curses his father or his mother, let him be put to death. So he goes back to this commandment that God had given through Moses to honor your father and your mother. One of the ways you honor them is, not, is by not cursing them. And we also know that God tells the children what? That they should obey their parents in the Lord. So as a child, we are to obey our parents in the Lord. And Paul picked up on that and he said, you know, that's the first commandment with promise. And I had asked the girls last night, I said, do you know what the promise is? Does anybody here know what the promise is? Jack, don't answer. <laughs> Honor your father, or <laughs> children, obey your parents in the Lord. And one of the girls goes, uh, that you'll live long on the earth. And I said, yes, you're right, but that's part two of it. That things will go well with you and you will live well, uh, long on the earth. Now, living long on the earth is not really a blessing unless things are going well with you. <laughs> and we could all say amen to that. And I love how God worded it. You know, that things will go well with you and you will live long on the earth. And then Moses, of course, he said by God speaking through him that they were to honor their father and their mother and nobody was to curse father or mother. And Jesus goes on and says, but you say... If a man says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is Corban, that is, a gift to God, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or his mother, making the word of God, the word of God of no effect through your tradition. And so this idea of Corban, you probably know what it is. It's like if you had a, it really goes back to, in those days, a inheritance, like if you had a piece of property and you had, you know, money in this property, uh, you could actually devote it to God with this tradition called Corban, and now you don't have to give it to your parents. And you don't have to help your parents. If your parents are in a hard way, you don't have to sell it or whatever to be able to help your parents. I, I cannot get my mind around this thing. Because if you got really, really, really bad parents, and you're you know, you're a person that's devoting things to God or wanting to devote things to God, why wouldn't you want to take care of your parents? And so they had figured out a way that they could slight their parents. Their parents have, have brought them and raised them, brought them up, raised them, provided for them and blessed them. And now the elders, they come up with this tradition, hey, you know what? You got a lot of property, you got a lot of money there, you can make a vow and devote it to the Lord and it can't be touched. You don't have to worry about losing it or giving any help to anybody. What a bunch of selfish people. That, that really, this is, it's all an issue of the heart, is it not? Our, our hearts are desperately wicked. We don't know them. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? God knows it. And so they had this tradition where they could actually not honor their father and their, money, their mother through the keeping of this tradition. But the thing that gets me there at the very end of verse 13, Jesus says, and many such things you do. Now, I might not have explained it real well. I think you probably understand it a little bit. But just this thought that there were many, many things like that that they did is a real eye-opener. This is how far the heart is from the living God. And when he had called the multitude to himself, he said to them, hear me, everyone. And understand, there is nothing that enters a man from the outside which can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. And if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. So Jesus speaks to the multitude about defilement. And obviously, he just said there that not what goes in, but what comes out. And he's speaking about ceremonial defilement concerning food. You're going to see that as we finish up and read on, that he's just speaking about food. Because there are things that can defile us from the outside, things that we give our eyes to, things that we give our ears to, or our hands or our feet to. You know, those things can enter into a man. They go into our mind, and we begin to lust and do things that we shouldn't be doing, and it becomes a defilement to us. 
So we can be defiled from the outside, but not concerning food, not ceremonial uh, food. And that's what Jesus is speaking of here. And so in verse 17, when he had entered a house, so now day's over, he enters a house away from the crowd, and disciples asked him concerning the parable. So he said to them, are you thus without understanding also? And you know, I would have been one of them. <laughs> I would have been, Lord, can you explain that parable to us? And he's like, man, don't you guys get anything <laughs> I tell you? You know, we don't get it, Lord. We don't know what you're talking about. I would have been one of them too. He goes on and says, do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him? Because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach. And again, this is all an issue of the heart. He's talking about the issues of the heart because these people draw near to me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. We know the Bible says that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? There's also a proverb that says, uh, he who trusts in his own heart is a fool. <laughs> the girls were asking me, where's that scripture? You know, and I'm like, well, if I had my phone, I could tell you, but I don't have my phone. Well, it's in Proverbs 28. I know that now tonight. In Proverbs 28, he who trusts in his own heart is a fool. So what do we trust in? We trust in the word. And the big challenge to you and me is that we need to read the word. We need to under, try to understand it, ask God to give us insight. We need to go to church and listen to Pastor Dave teaching and expounding on the word of God so we can get uh, greater insight, greater depth into the volume of the book. We need all of those things, but we don't trust in our own heart. We trust in God's word. God's word is our authority. And so whatever enters a man from the outside cannot defile him because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods. So this had to be revolutionary for them concerning dietary laws. And so as I asked last night, I'll ask again, so why then the dietary laws? Why did God say you can't eat pork? You know, it's got to split the hoof and chew the cud. If it only splits the hoof and doesn't chew the cud, you can't eat that animal. Or why can't we eat, you know, catfish doesn't have scales? Or why can't we eat lobster? I, I kind of like lobster or shrimp, you know. <laughs> so we can't eat bacon, we can't eat shrimp, we can't. You know, why did they have these dietary laws? I, I've heard a lot of people say, well, you know, the pigs back then, they didn't have a way to really cure them and get rid of all the terrible diseases and stuff. And that might be true. I, I really don't know. I don't know the reason that God gave the dietary laws. You know, when God says something in his word, we do well just to obey it and not to try to figure a way around it. And I'm not saying keep the dietary laws. I had a cheeseburger today and it had bacon on it. <laughs> and no, I'm not a Jew. <clears throat> and if I was a Jew, I would do it too. Because I know in the Bible that God has purified all foods and we can eat whatever we want. It might not be to the best of our health, but we're allowed to eat. Matter of fact, Old Testament Bible says when you come into the land, you can eat all the meat you want. So when I'm starting to feel bad about eating a lot of meat, I always think about that scripture. Wait a minute. I can eat all the meat I want. So I'll probably drop over dead with a, a heart attack real soon. But you know what? Hey, if I do, God takes me home. I'm, I'm good with that. So anyway, why the dietary laws? Well, another one of those things to me that when we get to heaven... And if you got to hang up with that and you get a chance to ask God, Lord, why the dietary laws? He'll just lay out the answer and you'll just go, you know, God, I am so glad you made those laws. I get it. I often use that type of an analogy. Like I had, there's this guy I'm working with right now on this job. He's a Christian, but he's, he's really kind of carnal Christian, you know. <laughs> he's not walking too close with the Lord. But anyway, you know, he asked me, he goes, you know, Mark... He goes, now, if God is all loving and all kind and he loves everybody, he cares for everybody, why in the world would some people end up going to hell? You know, he understands the sin problem and all that, but still he wrestles with the fact that some people would be eternally lost. And I, I totally get it. I say, yeah, I, I know what you're saying, Mark, but think about this one, bro. God created Satan knowing that he was going to do what he's going to do. God created him as, a, as an angel, and he fell. God knew that he was going to fall, did he not? He had to know. He knows everything. 
He created him, so why did he create him? And then we read in the Bible at the end, Satan is bound with a chain and he's cast into the bottomless pit for a thousand years. And then they go and let him out. And he goes around and deceives all the nations of the world and they all come against uh, Jerusalem and, and God burns them all up and he creates a new heaven and a new earth. Why? Why would he do that? How about the question, you know, I've got a three-year-old kid that's got leukemia and just died with leukemia. Why, God? And those are the things that we can wrestle with and we don't understand, but I guarantee you, when we get to heaven and we get to talk to the Lord and we get to ask him the most difficult question, why Satan, why leukemia, whatever it is, when he gives the answer, if in fact he does, and he probably will, the only response is going to be, God, I'm so thankful that you did what you did. I'm so thankful you created Satan. I'm so thankful you took my son, three years old, and he died because, God, I realize now, as your word has always said, that your ways are not our ways. Your thoughts are not our thoughts. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways past you finding out and my thoughts past your thoughts. God knows what he's doing. He's a good God. He's good and faithful. I don't understand a lot of the things that he allows. I just know he's good. He's in control, and he's true and righteous altogether. There's no unrighteousness in him, and I'm thankful for what he does, and if I don't get it, I got a pea brain, and you can ask people, do, do you, and I told this to Mark, this guy I'm working with. Mark, do you know everything? No. Well, do you know half of everything? No. Do you know a quarter of everything? No. He went, he, I figured he might have said yes on a quarter, but he didn't. <laughs> He's like, no. And I said, isn't it possible that the answer you're looking for lies somewhere in the unknown part of your head? Trust God. Trust God. He's faithful. He's just. He knows what he's doing. And then as we finish, it says, Jesus says, and he said to them in verse 20, what comes, out of a man that, uh, what comes out of a man that defiles a man, for, or not what goes in defiles him, but what comes out. For from within, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. And as I said, you know, it's, to me, it's like, what are we giving our eyes to? What are we giving our ears to? Where are our, what are we handling? Where are our feet taking us? And really, where are we allowing our feet to take us? And what are we handling? What are we watching? What are we listening to? And it's that type of stuff because the battle's in our mind, is it not? The battle's in our mind. And so as the evil things come in and we give place to the flesh, we begin to sow to the flesh, and if we sow to the flesh, we will reap corruption or death. But if we sow to the Spirit, like the Apostle Paul was saying, if I buffet my body, I make it my slave. I begin to sow to the Spirit, and the spiritual man gets strong. And then I put to death by the Spirit the deeds of the flesh. So these things that defile us, they come from out of the heart. And that's really the whole problem. Uh, in this whole chapter is, you know, the condition of the heart. The condition of the heart. You know, where's your heart? Are we drawing near to the Lord um, with our lips, but not in heart? May that not be so. Well, praise the Lord. Guess what? Jesus loves you. <laughs> As Dave would say, he'd rather die than live without you. He's a great and a mighty God. He's an awesome God. He's coming back. He said he would go away, and he said he's coming back. And I don't know when he's coming. I've been hoping that he would come a long time ago, and I still believe he's close. I know he's coming back, and I cannot wait till he comes back and sets up his kingdom. He's the only man, I believe, that walked this earth and never told a lie. He said, I'm going to go away and prepare a place for you, and I'm going to come back and get you and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. In John 17, he said, Father, I want my disciples to see my glory. I desire that they would see my glory. He wants us to see his glory. Oh, God, I want to see it. I can't wait. Amen. Father, we love you. We thank you for this night. We thank you for this time together in your word. And again, Lord, we pray for Pastor Dave, Lord, that you would strengthen 
you would heal, you would cast out what needs to go, you would just give unto him what is needed. And not just for him only, Lord, but for his boys, for his daughter, for Kevin and the church in Colorado. God, we just lift them all up to you. We ask God for a fresh anointing, fresh wind, fresh fire, God, that you would just move in a powerful way through our pastor and through his kids, through his wife. Lord, we're truly grateful for Pastor Dave. What, a, what an example he is to us. God, we just pray you'd restore him quickly to us. And Lord, we want to be in the center of your will. God, we want to be men and women that draw near to you with our hearts and not just with our lips. We don't want to go through the motions, God. Please help us, Lord. Turn our hearts into your way. Like you turn the heart of the king like a river, God, we pray you turn our hearts into the ways of the Lord. So be glorified in us, Lord, now as we go. We trust you, Father, for these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.